Docker? I barely know her. When SSRF is enough. Full Docker escape on Windows Docker Desktop CVE 2025-9074. This is a recent write-up that I'll leave a link in the video description, and I do want to give a big shout out. We'll hop over to his LinkedIn. Felix Boulet. I'm so sorry. I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Felix. Sometimes bugs don't need to be that complicated. This is the tale of how I found the full Docker escape that was attributed CVE 2025-9074, and that is now fixed. It is patched. So if you are running Docker for desktop on Windows or Mac OS, make sure you update, upgrade, get to version 4.44.3. Up until that version, an SSRF or like server-side request forgery or a simple web request from any container was enough to fully compromise the host computer. Now you might think of Docker usually running containers in like, oh, an isolated sort of guest space, but no, we mean physically the whole computer, the host computer, where the Docker engine and Docker service runs. Felix wants to shout out Felipe Duger. Again, I'm so sorry in pronunciation from Pivotal Technologies. He's a longtime friend and Docker expert, so I asked for his input and help during the research. I'll leave a link to his LinkedIn profile just as well in the video description. So here is the situation. On an unpatched Docker for desktop for Windows, anything below version 4.44.3, any container, running container instance, could connect to this IP address on this port without any authentication. They could create and start a privileged container so it could have access to the host and it could mount the host C drive running on Windows onto or into that container. With that, you gain full access on the Windows host. That means you have access to the file system. That's not immediately, oh, code execution on the host, but as I'm sure you know, you could leverage that write capability or any read capability, I guess, if you want, on the Windows file system, like to stage something into the startup folder or gain some other persistence via a scheduled task or whatever, and then eventually get further code execution and compromise the full computer. This 192.168.65.7 and port 2375 is the control plane or like the Docker service API, the capability to run Docker stuff, hey, spawn, start containers, create containers, etc. Again, I'll put a link to that in the video description, but I'm more interested in how can we play with it? Can we do this too? I thought, let's go ahead and install Docker Desktop on Windows and then see if we could recreate this in a vulnerable version. Of course, if we were to go try and download Docker Desktop for Windows from their website, we'll get a docker desktop installer.exe. And if you were to download this, this will be the patched version, like the latest 4.44.3. And there's no easy way that I could tell from the link or URL to be able to like, adjust the version that you're downloading. I don't think they show or offer or include, I couldn't at least couldn't track it down, any previous or older versions of Docker Desktop from their website. So to be honest, the next thought that I had would be to look on VirusTotal, or is this hosted or available for download anywhere else on the internet? VirusTotal keeps things kind of easy for us, and we know that the file will now be called Docker Desktop installer.exe. So we could simply search for files like with that file name. And if we get a couple hits, probably gonna get things recent from today-ish or around this time frame. And if we go click in one of these, the Docker desktop installer, in the details section, we might be able to get a clue as to what the version is. Scrolling down, we could actually see, oh yeah, exactly. File version information. Zooming in a little bit more, you could see this section here with the file version included as part of the data for the portable executable or the .exe file itself, we could see 4.44.3.202, blah, blah, blah. So that one is patch, right? That's version 4.44. Point three. I want the vulnerable one. So could I simply just like add to my query? I don't see why not. Let's try to see, could I just look for that as the file name kind of in strings? And I'm not even using like any operators here. I'm just gonna make this stupid, dumb and easy. Let me search for 4.44.2. Now, when we get results back, I do see a couple. Let's check the details on him. This one is perfect. File version information and this clues us in 4.44.2. So let me download this from VirusTotal. Click download sample download file. And now I have the Docker desktop installer on my desktop. Let me say I usually record videos inside of a virtual machine because I just prefer to do that when looking at malware and vulnerabilities and exploits and weird stuff, right? But I always get a little bit sketched when I have to record on my host. This might be a scenario because I have not yet provisioned or set up even this desktop machine to uh, virtualize
APIs inside of virtualized virtual machines. You know what I mean? Like nested virtualization because Docker on Windows uses Windows subsystem for Linux or WSL and WSL2. You could use Hyper-V just as well, but let me see if I can get this installed. Okay, installation succeeded. I have to restart my computer though. And since it's my host, I'm gonna stop recording for a quick moment. <laughs> okay, I have rebooted. Now I am inside of Docker desktop on Windows. We're gonna head and start the Docker engine. I guess I'll move my face a little bit further down. Obviously you could see, I don't know if that's funny. New version is available. Yeah, uh, we should update. I'll talk more about that later, but let's get this thing going just to show you in action. Okay, looks like Docker on Windows is ready. So let me open up a terminal and do I have the command on the command line Docker? I do. Okay, excellent. All right, now let's bounce back to the write-up and article for a quick second so we can see how the POC or proof of concept works. The entire exploit takes two post HTTP calls from inside any container. Okay, kind of easy. Post a JSON payload to slash containers create. Now again, this is like the API for the Docker engine, obviously giving us the capability to create a new container. Binding the host C drive to a folder inside the container, like slash mount host C colon host root, in the container and using a startup CMD or command to write or read anything under that host root on container startup. Now that we created the container, you do need to start it, but that's again, just coming from the API or this connection 192.168.57 or whatever, 2375 was the port. And you post to the container start endpoint with the ID of the container that you just created. That will launch the container and start execution. And because this is all web-based, right? Like the fact that you're just making two post requests, you could do like with curl or wget or Python or anything, right? Uh, you could have the opportunity to do this via a web app. Like if a web app were presented as a front end application and maybe it was just served out of a container. Well, if there were a vulnerability in that application where you had SSRF or server side request forgery, then you could just try to manipulate any of the capabilities, like use that vulnerability on its own to now exploit this. They mentioned you don't need code execution or you technically don't need code execution because if there's an opportunity to still make those web requests without running commands, this is doable. There's some really cool lessons here in the spotting the gap sooner section. At its core, this is just kind of an oversight because that internal API is reachable from any container without authentication or any other access control. Good reminder, critical security gaps often stem from the most basic assumptions. And look, they found this just by running nmap against the Docker documented private network. That's easy to do. It's not isolated, at least as we've learned. So you could always test your network isolation and don't trust that all security models are aligned by default. Cool takeaways, internal interfaces are not inherently secure. Assess every access path and entry points, both external and internal tests and scans are essential. And work with your friends. Encourage outside collaboration, even if that's just public and private bug bounty programs to find these low hanging fruit things. Because this is in essence simple, right? You're just creating a container, starting it, and then taking advantage of all the functionalities that Docker naturally gives you and with good intentions, hey, mounting capabilities from the host, being able to run commands, like that is good. So it's just taking advantage of the fact that this is all possible with just the hiccup gimmick that, oh, we could reach the internal API without any issue. They have a little uh, proof.mp4 or a video demonstration, but we could do the very same thing. We could try it out and run it ourselves. Proof of concept can be executed from any container running Docker run tack IT for interactive in a terminal. And they just use an Alpine image so Linux, right? Vanilla, bare bone basics, Alpine image using bin sh as their, okay, invoking command to run or entry point so that they have a shell they can interact from. Again, not necessary because if there is an opportunity for SSRF, this could all still be done. So let's take a look at this proof of concept that they have here. Obviously this is just simple bash, like running from the shell or bin sh as you ran within Alpine. And they're using wget, that small command line utility to be able to work with internet resources over HTTP. They send a header to provide a JSON blob and the post data that they use is just like you would expect in any sort of Docker container configuration. Specifying, oh, let's create a new container with an Alpine image again, use a command or CMD where they invoke sh, tax C to provide a command as an argument. And just as a simple test, they echo the word pwned into host root slash pwn.txt. That of course could be anything you want to read or write files or take things out of the host machine, put it in the container or the guest or 
write what could be something in the startup directory for later access, persistence, post-exploitation, etc. The gimmick here, though, of course, is using a host config that will bind or mount part of the host file system within the guest container. So the colon here is the delimiter, and because, hey, you've got the capability to reach mounted hosts in slash mount slash host in the C drive of the computer, Windows, host machine, in the directory slash host root. They don't output anything, so tack capital O to a hyphen or just nothing, or maybe that's standard output, forgive me. We'll see it when we run it, but obviously it's that exact same IP address and port number for the internal control plane or HTTP Docker API. They stage that as a temporary file, just create.json, so in a later line, they could retrieve the container ID. That's that CID variable that they set here. They're using command substitution, which is the dollar sign parentheses, the cut utility to use the delimiter of a double quote, field number four out of that file create.json. And then with that, because you know that was the key ingredient, we needed to get to the other HTTP endpoint for their API, containers, container ID, and then start it. No post data is necessary there, we just needed to hit that endpoint with a post request, but no like form, data, body, payload. Does that make sense? Like we could go through the process of, oh, changing this command, but I feel like we're okay. Check out one of the other previous videos when we were looking at the WinRAR CVE. You can see how it might write on the file system to start up. So that way there's code execution just as the computer begins and runs. Let's try to use this proof of concept, but first let's get a Docker image running. Back on our terminal or command line, remember this all happens inside of a guest container. So let's try to run TAC IT for interactive and teletype on the terminal, Alpine being the image name that we want to run. And then the command or entry point we'll start with slash bin slash sh. Will that work for me? Okay, I have a Linux prompt here. Now I am the root user inside of this Alpine Linux image, guest container. But if I were to, you know what? Let's open up uh, Windows Explorer. And you know what? Rather than exposing the root of my file system to you all on the internet, let me create just a directory for uh, Docker CVE test. Obviously this folder will start empty, but let's adjust our POC to now write to pwn.txt inside of the host root or part of the file system where we do have Docker CVE test and a forward slash to note inside of that subdirectory there. Does that make sense? Let's copy all this and let me put these side by side and then let's paste in this command. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't have to do anything else. I didn't have to say anything. It already, it just did it, right? Open that up in Sublime Text. It's exactly what you think. Bear in mind, I'm on my host computer. This is my desktop machine and I just wanted to do the little demo, light off the fireworks here, because of course we have now broken out of that Docker container that we were in and could have the capability on the whole rest of my machine. That's it, those couple commands. Obviously that is why this is a 9.3 CVSS out of 10 critical severity okay, uh, break out, escape the sandbox of a Docker instance. And I believe that's even beyond their encapsulated or enhanced container isolation feature functionality thing. There are links down below. We could go take a look at the CVE. CVE 2025-9074. Docker desktop allows unauthenticated access to a Docker engine API from containers. Yeah, even with or without enhanced container isolation enabled. And with or without the exposed daemon on that instance. Now this happens again, only on Windows, or at least that's what I've showcased. But if we take a look at the release notes from Docker, they're now offering this patch of 4.44.3. And this was released relatively quickly from what I understand. That's fixed, that's patched. But this is affecting Windows and Mac. If we look at Felipe or Philip, I'm so sorry. If we look at his blog, he covers the exact same thing. And again, we'll have a link in the video description. He tells the whole story, which is kind of cool. Uh, a little bit of the human walk back of of how this was approached. But of course, this is not going to be affecting Linux because Linux does not use a TCP socket for the Docker engine's API. It uses a named pipe on the host file system. Unless there's any like super specific unsafe misconfiguration, the container usually does not have access to that named pipe and can't make these internal engine like control plane calls to the API, right? But his little Mac OS proof of concept is done with just simple Python code. And he imports Docker. You can see the syntax here, import Docker, create a new client where you connect to that API and then run a whole new container of Alpine being the image, a command to run, touching the or creating the file 
slash mount slash pwn, where it has now mounted from what would have been the Mac OS file system slash users in their username, now slash mount inside the container. Neat, easy, too easy. Now, here's the thing. First and foremost, you should patch, you should update, you should get the latest version 4.44.3. Would recommend you do that, but I wonder, and I'm curious of your take, so please genuinely let me know in the comments, what is the likelihood of this being exploited? It is within a container. You don't need the code execution to be ran within the container. If there were a forward or front facing web app that SSRF was an opportunity or the server side request forgery vulnerability existed, then you could sort of chain this or enact and invoke this via that. Maybe that's a thing. I don't know how easily you might be able to fingerprint for what looks like a web app being ran out of a Docker container with the old version on Windows or Mac, but granted that it should be a Docker container running in production if it were to be exposed probably out on the open internet via Windows or Mac, that seems just a little unlikely to me. Regardless, extremely cool, neat find, and I think Felix was pretty upfront and like, hey, he stumbled across this and him and his buddy, his friend, were trying to go take a look, see how you could pull that thread. And that's how a whole lot of sweet, fun security vulnerability research stuff just tends to happen. Real bummer that there wasn't a bug bounty or anything, uh, sort of a payout for him, but I think it sounds like he's getting a sweet merch bag, so cool. But there you go, you know, that's it. That's what everybody's screaming and shouting about for uh, this big Docker 9.3 critical severity CVE 2025-9074. Patch your potatoes, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. Please do all those YouTube algorithm things, like, comment, subscribe. I'm gonna go remove the uh, vulnerable version of Docker that's installed on my host desktop machine. Uh, thanks. I'll See you later. <laughs>